man is the only known creature that can contemplate his own future, can contemplate not only the years that lie ahead of him, but also can consider what lies beyond his present physical embodiment. Because he has this faculty, it was inevitable that early peoples should contemplate the problem of life after death. Originally, this problem rested squarely upon the clergy or upon the priesthoods or the medicine priests or the shamans who led the spiritual destiny of the people. Later, however, a certain structure of inquiry crept in. Many were no longer willing to simply accept on faith and faith alone. They had confidence in their religious leaders, but some way a conflict came about between the teachings of the religious and the daily experiences of human life. By degrees, therefore, the custodians of the doctrine of the afterlife uh, changed the states. And from the priesthood, the tradition passed to the philosophical schools and the intellectual systems. The philosophical schools, of course, had their origins in the religious, and therefore, for the most part, followed along the general religious concepts. However, they tried to rationalize the doctrines of the clergies. They tried to prove intellectually, rationally, reasonably, that the teaching of immortality was philosophically sound, that, the, that it could be defended as well as accepted. The moment, of course, you defend something, someone else is unhappy about it, and assails your defense. While the belief was held largely by the priesthood, and the priesthood almost completely dominated the public mind, there was very little criticism or conflict in basic religious convictions. However, when the intellectual schools took over, there were certain disagreements among themselves, and a waiting public was not satisfied that the philosophers completely solved the problem. The philosophers seemed to make it more reasonable, but they did very little to the chronic doubter who continued to doubt and wanted some kind of physical evidence to support the religious and philosophical interpretations. This continued to be a problem for a long time and is still a problem in a great many personal lives and in a great many beliefs and schools. Finally, it came about that the newborn and rather precocious infant of the 17th century, science, became involved in the problem. Science was reluctant to take any part in the situation on the ground that science dealt with things that were physical, obvious, and could be examined, placed under laboratory controls, and could become the basis of research theses for those looking for a doctorate. The result of this was that the physical materialistic scientists uh, rather preferred not to become involved Privately, they might admit a belief, or they might deny any belief. But for the most part, the scientist took an agnostic position. He did not deny the possibility, but he pronounced solemnly that no proof was available 
And in his own opinion, there would be no proof that would satisfy him that man could accumulate. Now, in the last 20, 25 years, things have become somewhat more complicated in the personal life of the individual. He has become more interested in living. He also has become more interested in questioning the reasons for his own existence. It was easy in early times to say that all these things were locked in the will of heaven, that God alone knew why these things happened. Gradually, however, it became essential to the human mind that it begin to understand why God did what he did. And out of this came questioning and came a rising group of mystics and uh, persons concerned with a new approach to trying to solve the problem. And that prob uh, approach became closely associated with the rise of the psychological schools. Psychology seemed for a moment to be the open door into the world of the human mystery. Psychology, however, was largely academic, and most psychologists were as reluctant to discuss metaphysics as were the material scientists themselves. The psychologists did do considerable groundwork, but always it was dominated at least publicly, by the uh, patterns of academic procedure. Gradually, however, a new school has arisen among the scientific people, younger men and women coming into the sciences, arising in medicine, in psychology, psychiatry, all of these counseling subjects, these people have become more and more vitally concerned with the problem of the true nature of the human being. And it has gradually come to be admitted that there is much evidence that the one life theory on which most modern world thinking has been established is simply not adequate. The only way you can justify it is to frustrate everything else. In order to justify the one life theory, you have to take the universe apart and throw the parts away. You cannot uh, work into an intelligent concept of life. We cannot assume that the universe is meaningful or that there is a pattern of purposes behind the various manifestations in astronomy, physics, biology, and related fields. So it has gradually become more popular to suspect that there is a larger invisible background to evolution than we have been inclined to accept. We are beginning to realize that the world is very much like the iceberg that the greater part of it is under water and cannot be seen, that a greater part of our physical existence is invisible, and that we are simply living on the certain peaks of knowledge that rise above the surface of the ocean of the unknown. The unknown, however, must be important. There must be something there that explains the known because even with the best scientific advancement, the known does not explain itself, nor does man find suitable, satisfactory, and solutional answers to the various mysteries of his own existence. So we have this type of problem, and we have inherited it from our forebears, and we probably will always be faced with it. In the Western world, we have assumed that there was a certain survival factor. And that factor was largely dominated by a theological concept of punishment and reward. The individual leaving this world went to a dessert. He went to something that he had earned. He went to the uh, judgment of his existence. 
if he had lived well, he had a fair chance of a benevolent condition in the afterlife. If he had lived miserably and been a cruel and a dishonorable person, he would be subject to strange punishments and uh, all kinds of unpleasant diagrams, figures, paintings, etc. have been produced to indicate the condition of a soul in purgatory or perdition. This, however, was more or less a moral problem, and undoubtedly it frightened a number of generations into a state of conformity with prevailing opinions. We can't say that it increased virtue because of any great desire to be better. It uh, increased virtue because of fear of punishment after death. Gradually, however, this uh, has lost its flavor and has lost its impulse to condition human thinking. The average person today is not really heaven and hell conscious. He is not much interested in the thought, and down in the heart and soul of himself he does not believe that this doctrine is going to seriously affect him as a person. He is more apt to follow the idea that there is no life after death, and therefore all speculation is useless. He would rather be an, an atheist and believe in nothing than be a theist and believe in some of the things his ancestors accepted. It just did not seem to make sense. So now we have these new fields coming in. We have parapsychology. We have a tremendous increase in interest in psychic phenomena. We have more and more books being written every day reporting conditions of suspended animation and the probabilities of the survival of consciousness after death. These reports are met with a variety of reactions. Those who have always been of the idealistic mind uh, simply smile and say, well, after 5,000 years, they've caught up with the facts we always accepted. Others still remain uncertain, and uh, every book favoring life after death will somewhere along the line be faced with an, another book denying the premises in the one which has been previously issued. So the problem goes on and on, and there seems to be no really easy way to answer this question. Now, we also know that the average human being has certain faculties which he likes to use, and the divine power in its infinite wisdom has bestowed upon the individual a power of intuition. It has also given him the power to evolve, liberate, and develop mysterious, subtle powers, attitudes, and levels of consciousness locked within himself. And gradually, a number of uh, rather progressive thinkers have centered their attention upon the simple fact that the only way in which the average person can convince himself completely, beyond any question of doubt, and find the final evidence for the certainty of his own immortality is to search within himself for the instruments of this knowledge. He must finally discover that within his own nature are the instruments necessary to convince him of life after death. He will have to experience life after death ultimately. And in the meantime, he has powers to research his own inner life, to determine by means of the development of extrasensory gamut the conditions of life which he cannot see. And all of the research up to the present time that is carried on within enlightened individuals that, for the most part supports the idea of the continuity of human consciousness. Now, while the West was approaching all this in its normal manner, Western people have always been more or less objective, uh, and they object easily to almost anything. 
they have never been able to agree on any particular premise. And another point that has been in their disfavor for a long time is the tremendous materialistic overambition of Western peoples. A Westerner, for the most part, is an individual trying to improve his physical condition. He wants more money, he wants more status, he wants all of the good things of life. And the good things of life have become more or less an obsession with him. He also has been, been a very aggressive creature. He is always out conquering somebody. And in the process of revolution and upheaval, he has developed certain fatalistic attitudes toward life. The Western person is not by nature inclined to be contemplative. He is not the type that sits under a tree and meditates upon the mysteries of life. He is an individual who cuts down the tree, pollutes the ground, and finally turns around and tries to find synthetic escapes for the mistakes that he has made. He is a plunderer of life, not a supporter of it. As a result of this, he is not very much inclined uh, to contemplate optimistically, constructively, or idealistically the future of his own existence. He is faced with the same problem as every other corner of creation, yet he reacts to it quite differently from some other people. The reaction being largely dominated by his personal interests. The Western person is so tremendously dedicated to being himself that he mistakes his material structure for his real nature. Now, other nations are gradually catching on to this idea, and I think we can say with a considerable amount of regret that materialistic ambitions have been transferred to most other parts of the earth. Most nations now are in a great competition for material supremacy. They believe that they can achieve something or other by conquering each other. About all they have succeeded in doing to date, however, as to, is to liberate souls in this world on the battlefield or by starvation into the invisible realms which the conquerors and the conquered do not believe in. This is a sad but unfortunately part of a pattern that we cannot get over. Actually, this situation brings into focus the Eastern equivalent of some of our beliefs. And I suppose that for simplicity, dignity, and directness of approach, and for understandability and integrity, it would be difficult to find any school or any teaching that has been more successful in this uh, search and in this process uh, than the great heart doctrine of Amida Buddhism. Uh, the Buddha Amida is the central figure of a very large group of Buddhists, both in Japan and China, and in other parts of the Far East, and some even in the West, who represents the personification of enlightened love. Amida never lived. He is an ideal figure. He is an archetype. They know this. They know also, however, that Amida signifies or symbolizes, in a more or less concrete way, the infinite life of the universe manifesting through a combination of infinite wisdom and infinite love. In other words, our meter is space as love and wisdom. It is an eternal principle, a psychic energy permeating everything. It is the tremendous life principle which extends beyond the stars, beyond the galaxies, beyond anything that we know, and even in a mysterious way goes into the dark abysses of space and bestows upon them the blessing of the wisdom and love of reality. 
Hamidism, therefore, is a belief founded in a very simple concept, namely that everything that exists is a manifestation of the infinite love of life for its own creatures. That also each creature is an embodiment of this life principle. That each individual is responsible for the use that he makes of this principle. That he is responsible for the use that he makes of life and of living things. For this reason, Amidism is a philosophy or a religion of harmlessness. It recognizes no merit in destruction of any kind. It accepts no vengeances, no revenges. It can condone no grudges or intemperances or intolerances of any kind. Because all of these exist only where the being involved has not become aware that the universe itself exists upon a strange warp and woof of wisdom love. And that the two terms are interchangeable, that they are two names for the same thing. Wisdom is not separate from love. Love is not separate from wisdom. They are both manifestations of life itself in infinite, continuous manifestation. They represent this concept by a radiant figure, a figure that represents an evolvement of consciousness. Life in the process of growth is constantly producing superior types of things. Down through the ages it has resulted in the great descent of evolutionary procedures. Life is forever excelling itself. And as in the story of the chambered nautilus, Man, nature, the space around him, the universe, chaos, cosmos, are all in a case of constant growth. They are building noble uh, palaces and temples for their souls. Thus, everything is growth. And growth means that in the course of time, growth must result in things attaining a degree of superior growth. Growth is more than a physical situation. The individual is born, grows up, matures, grows old, and passes on. But this does not necessarily imply that he grows up. It only implies that he has moved through a period of time and has worn out the instrument with which he came into this world. The fact that he may leave almost as he entered is by no means unusual. And uh, there is plenty of evidence, scientifically collectible, to the fact that the individual can, with care and thought and ca discrimination, can leave this world as foolish as when he came here. He can carefully avoid anything that might result in improvement for himself. He might be careful also not to perform any action that is sufficiently unselfish to be, to be suitable to reward with some benefit. We have today narcotics problems. These problems affect people who are college graduates, successful in all walks of life, who simply do not care about trying to be any better than they are. And because of this, they are getting worse every day. We have the same with alcohol. The individual does not really care enough or believe enough about his own destiny to be concerned. He simply goes along and may very well leave as he entered, without very much growth or understanding or maturing of his own life. Other less flagrant problems simply represent self-interest, the individual living from day to day to do what he feels like, and gradually unable to do the things that he has always wanted to do, he fades away. Now this cannot be 
a proper interpretation of life by an intelligent creature. Man is born with a power within himself which, if he will use it, will enable him to make a much better judgment about his own conditions, the conditions of his world, and the purposes for both. As long as he is willing, however, to be ignorant, suffer the results of ignorance, and be miserable and unhappy in exchange for a few days, years, uh, or years of gratifications, he will be as he is. Now, in the doctrine of the Pure Land sect of Buddhism, we have the realization that has been bred into these people for thousands of years that life is important. Life is meaningful. We are here for a reason. We are here to fulfill a purpose, and that the real purpose is to grow rather than to accumulate. The real reason to be here is to become better, to make use of the opportunities of existence to enrich character and ennoble human relationships. If these factors are ignored, or even put in second position, the life is damaged or is imperfect or lacks full understanding of its own significance. The Pure Land, therefore, tells us very frankly that the individual must plan his own growth. That this growth is not something in which he can depend upon constant indoctrination by other people. Gautama Buddha, of course, who was the prime moving principle behind all Buddhism, observed on one occasion that I will not believe a doctrine because the scriptures say that it is true. I will not believe a doctrine because the great teachers have taught it. I will not believe a doctrine because my countrymen and those around me insist that it is true. I will not accept any of these things and blindly follow them. I will follow a belief or a doctrine only if in my own heart I am convinced that it is true. This is uh, one of the problems we have. People are believing, following doctrines and, and teachings, which their own hearts have not yet found ways to interpret or understand. Therefore, Amidism is called the heart doctrine. It is the individual growing up heart first and recognizing what are called the Buddha seeds that are planted by eternal life in the heart of man. He must help these seeds of truth, realization, and integrity to grow by dedicated effort. If he does not do this, then the real purpose of life is lost. Amidism arose as what is called the Northern School or the Great Doctrine. And the Great Doctrine is the teaching of the large path that leads to salvation. It is called the Mahayana school and is separated from the southern school which is called the Hinayana and is firmly set in Siam or Thailand and what is now Lanka was Ceylon. These southern followers follow an aesthetic life. They renounce all material things and putting on the robe wander into homelessness. In other words, to them, the life of, of truth is a monastic existence, a concept that also dominated Europe for many hundreds of years. The Mahayana, however, the large vehicle, says no. This is not the real answer. The real answer is not that the individual uh, shall perform these types of austerities because they are recommended or told to him by his religion or his philosophy or by his various teachers. The real answer to the entire problem is not to walk out on your job. 
It is not part of the plan of things that a person seeking holiness shall leave his own family, neglect his children, go into bankruptcy, and become dependent upon welfare. This is not the religious life. This is a symbol, a very cheap symbol, of poverty used as an example of piety. That the individual who gives up wealth, gives up all, is simply based upon the mistaken point of view that for that individual wealth is all, when it is not the case. What the Mahayana school teaches the individual to do is to stay with his job, do the things that he knows he should be doing, serve his fellow man unselfishly and thoughtfully, and at the same time keep in his heart the mystery of salvation. In other words, the heart doctrine is one of the continuous remembering of the divine plan and its purpose for us that this remembering goes into everything we do. It goes into the arts which we create. It goes into the labors we perform for common good. The carpenter builds a house remembering the infinite love of Amida. The mother with the child cares for the child and gives her whole heart to it, really and sincerely, forgetting self, because in so doing, she feels that she experiences immediately within herself the unselfish love of the Amida. So where unselfishness leads, Amida is present. Where selfishness leads, the rather unpleasant figure of the demon kings begin to arise. They are not the symbols of the pure doctrine. One of the simple symbols of Amidism is the symbol, what is called the symbol of the, of the presence of the other. Every uh, monk or priest or devout member of the Amida sect believes always that he walks and lives and thinks with another. There is this other person whom he cannot see, but who never leaves him, and is constantly guiding, protecting, and guarding him, and constantly helping him to sustain his faith. This other is not, however, an imaginary being dreamed up by his own need. This other is life itself, a life which is present everywhere always, and protects all who serve it, and punishes all who damage it that as long as the person lives according to the laws governing life, he is under the protection of the strongest virtue and the most magnificent principle that can possibly exist. Now, according to the Buddhist doctrine, of course, the concept of gods or deities is very different from what we have. This is why, in many instances, these people have been called idolaters. They are supposed to be worshipping graven image, images. Actually, this is not true. The concept is, however, that instead of a mysterious, eternal uh, principle of theocracy governing all things, that everything is in a constant process of growth. The gods are growing along with creation. They are not sitting in judgment above the divine workmanship. They are part of it, because all of these deities are actually, of any nation or of any people, are actually merely manifestations of the radiant, creative, and redemptive energy of one power. Now, the, the Buddhist realizes that this one power has other names. He does not attempt to insist that it has to be called anything. But it has to be recognized that all of the leading powers, all the laws, all the forces that govern existence are servants of the purpose of existence itself, 
which is the perfection of all that lives. Therefore, the so-called demigods or deities are agencies by means of which the purposes of infinite enlightenment are being advanced. According to this doctrine, uh, Buddha tells his disciples the story of the Buddha Amida, that once upon a time, aeons, millions of years ago, there was a mendicant, just like himself, a wanderer upon the face of the earth, searching for truth. And this wanderer passed through many, many embodiments and found more and more uh, of the light that he needed and desired. And at last, after hundreds of lives, he at attained to the condition of an ahat, or an enlightened servant of the law. And in this condition, he gradually performed more and more saintly works until it was finally his merit over millions of years to become a bodhisattva. Bodhisattva means an enlightened self. And when he came to this degree, he became embodied in great labors of philanthropy, great labors of service. He contributed to the good of all things in a strange and wonderful way because he was gradually diffusing himself throughout life. He was no longer working for himself. He was not even working for life. Life was working through him to the fulfillment of its own purposes. And finally, in the great day, be with us, it is said, this being attained to the right of Buddhahood. And this right was the highest good to which the being could ascend and still exist as a being in a universe of conditioned existence. And when the time came for Amida to attain to Buddhahood, he then took the great vow. The vow being that he would not accept the fullness of his own labor. He would not pass on into the infinite love of Amida. He would not go into that great glory of perfection from which there is no return. He would not leave this world until, and then he made the vow that is important to our present subject. He said, I will not attain or accept liberation from the responsibilities of existence until I can take with me into the other land the smallest of all things, the tiniest gnat floating in a sunbeam. There shall be nothing so small that I will go into perfection without taking it with me. And as a reward for this vow, he was made the Lord Buddha of the Western Paradise, the Paradise of Amitabha, which is nothing but his own heart. And in this heart is the radiance of salvation, a salvation that must, however, always be earned, a salvation which is like a schooling. It is not bestowed. Salvation is not something that can be handed to someone. It is not something that can be produced by miraculous means. It is not a fulfillment based upon what we would like or what we want or what we think we deserve. Uh, actually, enlightenment is the condition of the internal realization that we are created for one purpose alone, and that is to advance the destinies of all that lives. So with this vow, Amida became the guardian of the Western Paradise. Now, we have not noticed uh, many times in reading religious books and so forth that nearly always paradise is located in the West. We have a term, slang-like term that we use here, that when someone passes on, they go West. We are not certainly involving them in Buddhism, but it seems that always in the Greek mythology, the Blessed Isles are to the west. 
The new Atlantis was to the west. The utopia was to the west. Always the blessed lands of perfection are to the west. And the ancients firmly believed that this western hemisphere was to be the blessed land. And certainly that was the teaching of Buddha in his, uh, of uh, Bacon in his work, The New Atlantis. It was to the West. And it was a place where all good things would be done and where human beings would live together in peace and happiness and wisdom. And as he puts it, that all knowledge should be for one purpose only, the accomplishment of the greatest good for the greatest number without any implication of selfishness. So Amida, however, in the Western paradise, lives in a radiant world symbolically represented by the Taima Mandara in Japanese Buddhism. Here he is seated in paradise, and he is uh, surrounded by the 16 intercessions by means of which he serves those who need him. And all of these intercessions are based upon one pattern, primarily, that he approaches those who have approached him. Whenever any human being, from the depths of his heart, asks for the participation in the mystery of divine love, and wishes to have the opportunity to love without self, to love without any hope of reward, without any anterior motive, then this is the love of Amida in himself. This is the other who walks with him. This is the highest aspect of his own nature. And this highest aspect is always part of the one great love aspect of creation. So the Amida's doctrine has developed gradually, particularly through the teachings of two great monks, Honen and Shonen. These two men, uh, of entirely different temperaments, made great contributions to Japanese Buddhism and became the leaders of the school of the Amida sect. They didn't originate it, it originated in China, but they were the ones who gave it its greatest impetus in Japan. It has been called a Protestant Buddhism, and this in very large is its best definition. Honen was a very interesting man. He was a man who had to stand by while his father was brutally murdered. And as he grew older, he went to the religious life and was finally faced with probably the greatest test that a person can be faced with. He had to convert or enlighten the assassins of his father. He had to spread the love of Amida from his own heart to cover them. He had to love them in the name of truth more than he hated them in the name of the crime they had committed, and he succeeded. He succeeded in forgiving them and bringing them into a redemption. And they were definitely converted and became monks. So Shonen was a different type of man. He was a man more or less worldly in nature, impatient, dedicated, very truth-seeking, but not exactly by nature gentle or pious. He had many strange experiences and finally decided that he wasn't even worthy to be a monk because he could not even control himself properly. But gradually, uh, through the assistance of those around him, he achieved the tranquility of spirit which made it possible for him to go on and become the founder of a great sect. There's something somewhat reminiscent in these two men and the Western experience of Peter and Paul. Peter would correspond to Honan, Paul to Shonan. 
These two became the great leaders of the Pure Land School, which was to have such a powerful effect upon the life of the Japanese people and of Buddhism in general. One of the interesting labors of the Pure Land sect has been its advancement of education. It has founded many schools, not only relating to religion, but to all arts and sciences. Buddhism has never in its entire history uh, been ob an objector to science or progress. It has never condemned a scientist. It has never imprisoned an intellectual. It has never committed any crime of, uh, that would be interpreted as frustrating uh, progress because of personal or, or, or sectarian bigotry. It has accepted all the truths that came to it. It has accepted Western life, Western science, Western medicine without a quiver. It has done whatever seemed to be right because the teaching is that it doesn't make any difference what these things are. Anything in this world that helps or improves anything or serves anyone is part of the very being of Amida. Amida is the one that makes all discoveries that help to advance human life. Amida protects the weak, it educates the ignorant, it takes care of the sick, it gives ritual and consolation to the bereaved. No matter what sect it belongs to, what creed it is, where it unselfishly serves human need, the spirit of Amida is with it. Call it what you will. There is no problem of trying to convert one to another belief. The only conversion necessary is to realize for the person involved that the good deed he is doing is because this good deed is a ray from the eternal life of good everywhere in space. So uh, Amidism has a space dimension that is very interesting. It takes us far out beyond the common boundaries of the universe and places at the seat of things a power, the power of infinite love, that this is the basis of everything. Now the intellectual will say it should be perhaps not just love, because love is very personal sometimes and is sometimes inclined to spoil the naughty child or to overlook faults and things of that nature. But then Amidism answers again with the same answer. If love is weak, it is not love. If love is capable of spoiling someone, then it isn't true love. It isn't the love of Amida, because this is the love of that which must be the eternal good for the one who gives and for the one who receives. But assuming that love might be regarded as deficient in engineering and things of this kind, then wisdom comes. But wisdom is just another name for the same thing. A wisdom is simply an attribute, an aspect, and love has two great uh, uh, aspects, one wisdom and the other strength. The strength of love is that which permits it to endure regardless of persecution, regardless of death, regardless of anything. Strength is the immovable foundation of reality. Wisdom is the, is the uh, willingness, the skill uh, to devise the ways and means for accomplishing the works of truth. Wisdom is the servant of love, not the master. Wisdom is that which rationalizes and makes reasonable that which the heart knows to be true. And wisdom also is the power which finds ways to put love to work in the world to achieve the good that is necessary. So Amida's paradise in the pictures and, and various imageries is a very interesting spot. 
It is a beautiful place, of course it would be. But the, uh, the paradise of Amida is not heaven. It was never considered as such, really. It has nothing in common with the idea of a place where we go into an unknown infinite and uh, no one knows what we're going to do after we get there. Uh, that's too abstract to fit into a plan. The Amidist is quite certain that the mere fact that an individual dies does not liberate him from responsibility. Responsibilities transcend death. They transcend all changes. The responsibilities continue until they are met. And the moment a responsibility is met, another one appears. There is no end to the fact that the human being is created to serve. And when he is no longer serving in the present embodiment, he is serving elsewhere. There is no such a thing as a lazy salvation. There is no one who is going to be able to experience the idea of departing from this life and resting forever. He is not going to float to heaven on flowery beds of ease, as the old psalm used to say. He is not only one more river to cross, there are many more rivers to cross. And the individual will finally discover that this fact, that there is a job over there, is just as much a reward and an evidence of love as it would be to leave the individual in some place of achievement with no projects, no purposes, and no reason for being there. So the Amidist to heaven, or paradise in this case, is a middle ground. It is the halfway house toward perfection. It is the place where the individual who is part of this life cycle passes out of physical existence and becomes involved in the consequences of his own conduct. He is also ultimately involved in the restoration or reconstruction of another body and to be prepared to go on with this material problem until he has solved it. Therefore, paradise is a vacation. It is not an endless state of liberation. But the paradise of Amitabha is a very, very nice place. The people, souls that go there are divided on the levels according to their attainments and according to their integrities. It is not expected that the child soul is going to be fully wise. It is not expected that those who are still imperfect but well-intentioned are going to be simply forgotten or punished because they did not make the superior grade. In the great principle, no one ever fails the school. He simply doesn't do as well. He may not be among those who gets the Phi Beta key right away, but he is coming along with everybody else. And in the paradise or western world of Amida, there is an appropriate level of reward for every degree of human achievement. The most simple and sincere person is just as fortunate as the very brilliant individual who has accomplished great things. Everything is measured only in the terms of this accomplishment as it bears upon the internal integrity of the individual. And very often those who accomplish the most in the material world achieve the least in the development and release of their own spiritual content. Another interesting point in Mamida's paradise is that uh, over there uh, you go to school. Now this might seem as though it would be a very great hardship, particularly after attending one of our universities here. But in the old paintings it's all very charming and delightful. Uh, in the western paradise of Amitabha there are uh, jewel trees. Beautiful trees covered with festoons of jewels, where beautiful birds sing, and where beautiful creatures like the deers of Kasuga wander about, heavenly spirits, 
Here also are the angelic beings scattering flowers from the sky. It's very lovely. And under the tree is an old wise man sitting quietly teaching his disciples. They are all learning. They are all experiencing. Because while they are over in the Amida's paradise, they are again required to catch up something that they have forgotten. They have been there before in one degree or another, but when they went into mortal life and so forth, the whole chain seemed to be destroyed. So after death, they go back to that level and continue, and in the course of their after-death experiences, they learn the meaning of the life they lived here. They become capable of interpreting it. And if necessary, the old sage is there to inspire them. He cannot do it for them, but he can try to help them to do it for themselves. In the uh, Buddhist system, no one can save anyone else. Each individual must work out his own salvation. But all of us can help the individual to understand these principles and inspire him uh, to live according to the law. We can do many things to comfort him materially. We can help him in his physical problems and he can help us in uh, ours. But the development of the eternal truth within himself must be gained through the release of the powers and qualities of his own nature. Now also in this uh, beautiful garden land of Amitabha, or Amida's paradise of the West, we have the river that passes through, which uh, occurs in our Western theology, as the one more river, the Jordan, the symbolic Jordan, the, the, the river Styx of the Greek myths, across which Charon ferries the souls of the dead. In the... Uh, the Buddhist system, this is the river that divides this world from the other. From the, it is the river of energy, the river of the ethers, the river of the vital fluids and forces which form the invisible atmosphere of the planet Earth. This humidity, as the Greek philosophers called it, this something that we call the etheric realm becomes the river. This etheric realm also is the etheric body of the individual, the body that must be gradually transmuted. But to cross from this world into the other requires the help of a boat. Now, we have never thought too much about boats, and yet the early church did. The papal ring of the ancient time, the fisherman's ring, always had the symbol of a boat on it. The nave of a church means the ship. And our word navel comes from the same word. In other words, the church is the ship of salvation. And the congregation, by means of this ship, is carried across the waters of illusion to the blessed security of spiritual strength. So the ship is there, and in the Buddhist symbol, it is a very pleasant little boat. It is, of course, built like a Chinese junk. It would be in that part of the world. It has two eyes painted on it so it can see where it's going, just as in the fishermen's boats in Hong Kong and Shanghai. And the, uh, the oars, or the rudder of the boat, may be Amida himself. Or if not Amida, then his beloved son, uh, Avalakita Svara, who has become feminized into the form of Kwan, Kwan Yin or Kan Nan. In the body of the boat are people doing all kinds of things. And I think it is interesting that the doctrine includes the idea that most of these people do not know where they came from, do not know why they are there, and do not know where they are going. For them it's simply a vacation. They are outward bound. And in the uh, ship of the doctrine and many of the old prints of it, the, the old man sitting on the back deck with a fishing pole fishing across the river. This is a kind of a quaint whimsy. 
but it is more than it seems to be because this ship which carries us across may be regarded as faith it may be regarded as hope but it is something that we have to experience as transition it is the process of moving from this world to the next sometimes it's in sleep sometimes it's in waking sometimes there is a clear memory of parting others there is not any memory some wake up long afterwards but this is the ship or the symbol that carries the life from this world to the next and it is the body of energy fields the ethers which forms the vehicle for the transmission of the consciousness from this world to the next when the physical body is gone the etheric body takes over and that is the ship of the doctrine it is that which carries us to another port but cannot go with us beyond that point also in the armida system we have the way of of att attaining a certain meditational life the armida has a kind of a mantra namo amida buddha which means adoration to the buddha amida this is something that is a song that uh, the devotees may sing as they walk along the road or particularly monks making a pilgrimage to a shrine or something of that nature but this, this these words stand for something they stand for a continuing attitude they stand for the fact that the heart itself sings this is quite important to their philosophy it is the singing of the heart in themselves as they go along doing anything of life that they are supposed to do they are constantly worshiping reality nothing that they do is trivial nothing that is done is done without a full spirit of insight and a full dedication wherever the person goes whatever job he performs if he cashes a check or sh puts a new sole on a shoe as he proceeds he rece recites the words adoration to the amida buddha in other words all these things everything that is done is an offering it is an offering of the human soul to that which is its own source and salvation i remember in last in the late 60s when i went over to japan on one of my earlier trips i noticed in the taxi cab the driver had a little uh sacred painting little sacred picture uh, a little ofuda as it is called a picture of amida and it, it was in his cab so i talked to him a little while and, and uh, i asked him i said is this a charm is this uh, something that you carry as a relic or um, as like as a holy medallion or something of that kind he said well i guess maybe it is uh, i said does uh, do you believe that it has power uh, to protect you no i do not believe it has the power to protect me but i believe it will remind me not to do the thing for which i would need protection is that i drive my cab every day as though buddha was riding with me the other this the is the another is that if i drive always as though buddha is driving with me i will be careful i will drive honorably and when the come comes time comes to pay the bill i won't cheat because i believe that if i do these things and every time i look at the little pic the little picture in my cab it reminds me of my own faith in case it should slip a little or something of that nature but it is also the symbol of the presence of eternal love with me every hour of the day and every hour of the night 
with me in my the home in the when I'm sitting with a sick child uh, when my parents die all these things happen all these things have to be within the love of Amida and uh, in this great faith and hope love is the secret probably uh, of these of this faith and why it has developed such a large following now some will say that this is inconsistent with Buddhism the true real Buddhism is a kind of an ascetic philosophy many have said that Buddha was an atheist he was not an atheist and he says very frankly himself I am not an atheist others feel that he's very mysterious and has all kinds of magical abracadabra in connection with his worship as it has appeared in the tantric philosophies of India and Tibet this is not the simple Buddhism of Gautama the real answer to the situation seems to be that Buddhism is simply a basic concept of universal integrity that the universe is a conscious honorable thing that the universe is too honest to ever break its own law and too enlightened to ever make a law that isn't good that all the laws that flow out of the darkness of space are laws of love that they come from the great heart of life and the great heart of life is the infinite ultimate spiritual sun the energy of which sustains the galaxies and, and sustains all the clusters of stars and world systems as far as imagination can go borrowing from the Hindus long ago Buddhism realized uh, that this was not the only solar system that we were not the only planet that we were not a unique creature or being in space and certainly we were not exiles uh, in the great uh, Lotus Sutra uh, in which Gautama uh, preaches to his disciples at the moment of the revelation of the Sutra the beings the Buddhas the great ones from myriads of sons rulers and guides and teachers of ultimate billions of habitable existable spheres in space all attended it was a symbolic statement of the fact that Buddhism taught that every star was part of the great cosmic plan of infinite radiant love it wasn't a question as to whether the star or the planet was inhabited by mortals the planet or the star itself was love itself in its own nature fulfilling some part of the universal destiny that not a thing exists but it has use and in proper use is fulfilling the vow of its own renunciation for the stars like man must swear that they will not enter the eternal paradise the great ultimate of things until all that they control or dominate or regulate can go in with them the, with the motion of space everything must move together in the Amida system the final part of Nirvana the end of mortal existence is reserved for those who have solved all problems and in whose nature and life karma has ceased now there are a great many people who don't like karma they take it very personally they feel that it is one of the most common detriments to their happiness what is actually karma is not anything of this nature at all because the karma rewards good just as quickly as it is said to punish ill karma does not punish ill ill punishes itself but it is the law of karma that regulates the procedure law of the karma also rewards itself but as time goes on through the evolutionary processes of things the individual by learning by living 
by dying, by being reborn, by contemplating and meditating the realities of existence, gradually learns not to make the common mistakes that have burdened him for maybe many hundreds of ages. He discovers the virtues of life. He begins to practice greater kindness. He is more thoughtful. He lives a cleaner life. He is more attentive to those values which are good. His love of beauty increases. His integrities are strengthened. And gradually, karma fades out. When the debt is paid, it's finished. The only reason why karma hangs on is because we have too many unfinished debts. But when we finally meet them, then the karmic responsibility fades out little by little. And according to Buddhism, it is karma that brings us back. It is karma that causes incarnation. When we are perfect, we don't live here. Many people have noticed the comparative lack of perfection. <laughs> the, uh, as soon as we have achieved freedom from, the de from our own mistakes, when we no longer compound the felonies of ourselves, then the karma ceases, and the individual gradually retires from objectivity as we know it to the higher realms of nature. When all bonds it cease when the individual has exhausted every weakness of his own nature, when he has attained all righteousness, when at last there is nothing more to learn, nothing more to accomplish, and he has set in motion the, the wheels of redemption for everything within his domain, then according to Buddhism, he may retire into the state of Buddhahood. From this state, he cannot return to this world as a person, because in correcting his mistakes, he has also exhausted his personality. The moral rule being, a personality is a mistake. It is a compound of errors. It is a structure composed of things that are not being done well. In other words, the personality is a monument of weaknesses, imperfections, delinquencies, or those vacuums caused by ignorance and thoughtlessness and self-centeredness. Therefore, the personality cannot attain perfection, because perfection is the final release from it. We will never have a perfect personality, because there's no place in space to put it. <laughs> but when we exhaust the personality, then we reach the point, finally, where we can no longer come back, because the mistake that would draw, draw us back no longer exists. The, when this state happens, the bodhisattvas, according to the Mahayana school, leave one mistake. They purposely leave one shortcoming so that they can come back and serve. After the, this one shortcoming is finally met and paid for, then they cannot return. But they purposely leave something as a link between themselves and a world in pain in order that they may continue to serve, to serve by enlightening. According to the Buddhist concept and according to Buddha's own doctrine, those who enter the final Mahaparinirvana, or the extinction of self, which is the uh, troublemaker, the, then the, the being is re reunited with life itself, and continues to exist in life as life, in a great reservoir of life. But the only way it can come back is through life. 
In other words, that which cannot be born again on earth is born again in the heart of every believer because it has now become universalized and is one with all that lives and becomes part of the sole heritage of dreams or ideals or hopes or aspirations which are to bring ultimate liberation to others. It's a fascinating story and a very interesting doctrine. And uh, we are gaining considerable information and assistance from it in, in our studies of abstract philosophical problems. The psychology of the Buddhist system is extraordinary, as Professor Max Muller pointed out. Whereas most of our systems are essentially founded in theology, uh, this is founded very largely in, in a kind of cosmic justice. It is not a system in which you worship primarily uh, by paying homage to something. You worship by releasing life, wisdom, and truth through your own conduct. There is no ritual that can take the place of release. And this release must be by intention. And this intention comes by dedication. No one is expected to be better than they can be. But each one is expected to be a little better than he might be. And this process uh, keeps on going in the redemption of the human being. There is no theological structure. All goes back to a great astral theology or a great cycle theology in which the universe itself is one vast living thing and the, the Amidas regard it as the Buddha Amida and this great living thing in whom we live and move and have our being is also the thing in which what this thing itself lives and moves and has its being in us. And we are gradually achieving the liberation of the Amida. We are gradually fulfilling the vow of Amida. All the world together, by growing, reaches the point where it fulfills the original vow, namely, that we are now ready with all other creatures to go with Amida into the Western Paradise. When this happens, then we have all achieved. But Amida cannot make this happen. Amida can only sit quietly. And through helping, through teachings, through art, through music, through contemplation, through meditation, and through all these self-disciplines, to inspire the individual to finally make this ad adjustment and advancement for himself. The individual becoming aware of the great law, becoming aware of the eternal plan, has the right to dedicate himself to it. And through this dedication carried on through many lives, he ultimately becomes part of the liberating power. The only way we can pick this old earth up and put it back among the stars. It's for each individual to pick himself up by the nap of the neck and put himself back on the path of integrity. There is nothing else that will do it. There is no way that we can look forward to a time when the fulfillment of the great rule can be accomplished except by ourselves. Now, some theologies approach it differently on the ground that there will be a dividing between the uh, sheep and the goats and that those who do not make it will simply go to perdition, be, elim be eliminated, or will be passed into some other state of condition, and that only the righteous will survive. The Amidas doctrine can't accept that, any more than it can accept a salvation which does not find place for a small bird, or a little worm, or an insect, or maybe a, t a tiny thing living upon garbage and corruption. That thing, too, must come to attainment. Therefore, in Amidism, there cannot be a division in which the good go on and the, and the evil do not. The good in man goes on and the evil fades out. 
but there is no way in which Amida can achieve liberation by casting out of his own mercy, his own love, and his own wisdom any soul for its imperfection. Therefore, the labor must go on until each one is finished. There can be no release, no perfection, no ultimate state except that of reunion with the perfect love of the Amida Buddha. This is perhaps a summary, but it may give you a slight understanding of some of the interesting points in connection with this faith, which may make them, may make some points a little clearer to us. We, don't, we do not have to accept the faith. It has nothing to do with it. In fact, secretly and, gen and now more generally, it is realized that in the first century, Christianity, in its original form, reached India. And that it was at the time that Christianity, in its original form, reached India, that the great vehicle was created. In other words, it is now suspected that both of these things happening in the first century A.D. are not merely coincidental, and that a very large part of Mahayana Buddhism has been inspired, influenced, directed, and conditioned by contact with Christian principles. So we have another interesting point uh, for general consideration. Now I have an announcement I'd like to make, which I hope you'll listen to fairly attentively. We have on our program a lecture to be given here, I believe, on October 21st. Uh, let's see, this is is cancelled. The uh, speaker was a person by the name of Barbara Taub, T-A-U-B, and by circumstances beyond her control, she is unable to be here. So if you were planning on this, uh, make the correction on your program. And I will be going, I'm going to give a little uh, time to myself now. I'm going on two weeks vacation. And I uh, will then be back with you as usual, and I hope that you all have a, a good time. Be sure and visit Mrs. Olson's collection of pictures in the library. They're really outstanding, and I know you'll enjoy them. Thank you very much.